Welcome to the Big Ben Show with me, Lester Holloway and Alex Watson. And a happy uh, International Potato Day to you. Uh, it is, in fact, the International uh, Day of the Humble Spud. But we're not going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about uh, uh, far more important matters. We've got a very packed uh, and interesting show. We want your calls uh, on the issues and topics uh, which we'll be discussing uh, today. Uh, we'll be uh, looking at the papers, including uh, a big story, which I'm sure you've seen, about um, Cecil the lion. Uh, this is uh, a lion uh, in Zimbabwe uh, which has been uh, killed uh, by a trophy hunting uh, American dentist. Uh, everyone is now after him and he's uh, gone into hiding. Uh, but interestingly the petition uh, justice for Cecil the lion has now topped 130,000 uh, signatures. Uh, so what does this actually say about um, our priorities and uh, how many, I wonder, of those 130,000 people uh, want justice for uh, a dead lion actually supported the, uh, uh, the, the movement uh, when it came to protesting about um, deaths at the hands of uh, police or uh, the Black Lives Matter campaign. That's an issue which we'll be uh, discussing uh, a little later on. And uh, I guess it sort of relates as well to uh, the fact that often animal charities have uh, far more uh, income from donations than and uh, charities dealing with uh, humanitarian uh, issues. There was a story about that uh, recently today, which we'll uh, discuss a little later on as well. Uh, we'll also be talking about uh, reparations. Uh, there's a march taking place uh, this Saturday uh, demanding uh, justice uh, for the international uh, uh, crimes committed uh, during the period of slavery. Uh, but are you going to be joining uh, that march and uh, is, it, uh, is it important? We'll also be talking about, uh, looking uh, historically, uh, with the author Martin Hoyles uh, about um, uh, some historical characters which uh, you may or may not uh, know about, including uh, Otto uh, Coguano and uh, William uh, Cuffey. Uh, do you know who they are? If you don't, then do stay tuned and uh, uh, the uh, uh, writer and historian uh, will tell you all about them. They are uh, characters uh, from the British past that you do need to know about because uh, as uh, black people they've made a big contribution to uh, English history. Uh, we'll also be talking, if we've got time, about uh, affirmative action. Uh, one of the candidates uh, for London Mayor, Sadiq Khan, has been calling for affirmative action, uh, US style, uh, to deal with underrepresentation of black people uh, in the police force. Uh, we'll be speaking to uh, someone who's a big supporter of uh, Sadiq Khan. Uh, that's uh, Leroy Logan, the ex-senior policeman. Uh, he'll be uh, joining us uh, very shortly uh, in the show and uh, we'll be talking about uh, policing and uh, Sadiq Khan and uh, why, uh, in Leroy's view, uh, he uh, trumps uh, Diane Abbott uh, or David Lammy. Uh, what is it about uh, Sadiq that uh, is better than David or Diane? We would we'll definitely be dying <coughs> to uh, know about that. Uh, we'll also be looking at uh, the papers uh, with with uh, Paul McFarlane, uh, employment lawyer. That's uh, coming up uh, very, very shortly. And uh, we'll be uh, looking at a number of stories, including Calais. Uh, you've uh, seen in uh, some of the uh, papers, uh, Nigel Farage, the leader of the UK Independence Party, has been calling on the army uh, to go and sort out uh, the refugees uh, in Calais. Uh, is this just stoking up fear of, of immigrants? And uh, what does the UKIP leader actually want the army to do uh, when they get down there uh, to Calais? They're normally trained for conflict, but uh, surely that's not what's needed. It's actually about um, uh, sorting out uh, how many of those refugees are going to be taken by Britain, who are only taking a very, very small number of uh, refugees from Syria, uh, but they're not accepting at the moment a single person uh, who is uh, uh, currently residing in what's called the jungle, a very insulting term, uh, which is the camp, uh, the illegal camp in Calais, where a lot of uh, immigrants, including from the African continent, uh, who are currently uh, there trying to get into uh, Britain. We'll be discussing uh, all of that um, and more. And of course, um, Alex, so you're, you're with us again, but uh, yes. for, the, for the last time, Hello. very sadly. So uh, tell me what's, uh, what's happening and where are you going? Oh, I don't know how much I can say. Um, basically, I'm going to be starting a new show. Um, starts tomorrow at seven, I believe. Watch this space. And um, I'll be talking to the Metropolitan Police um, about various subjects pertaining to what's going on in their organisation and also what's going on in wider society and I'll be having guests in and to talk to them about specific subjects as well. So, um, well, It's not just covering the police, is it? You'll be looking at other subjects as well? Yeah, we'll be covering all subjects but we will be having um, 
them in a lot to put their perspective or th their spin and, 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 and have that community dialogue between, between um, the police and the wider community. And I want to see how we can um, um, open that dialogue, bridge that gap and see if we can come to some um, ways forward or in, in our thinking or understanding of what the police do and, and how it might be, um, you know, how, how we can learn from it and how we can, you know, negotiate those relationships with them. And, you know, I, I think as a, um, you know, I think as a member of the public um, and as a, as a black person, as a black woman, I often fall on that side that, that might say, you know, that, that might feel, you know, antagonistic towards the police because of some of the things that have historically happened. So for me, it's a good opportunity to be able to um, get under the skin, so to speak, and, and, and find out how things really, really work and how they work on the ground and kind of see if we can build some kind of um, dialogue. Mm, okay, okay, yeah. well, well yeah. <laughs> it's obviously very, very sad to, uh, to see you uh, uh, go, Alex. Why are you smiling that. then? Uh, why am I smiling? <laughs> because, uh, well, I don't know, it's, uh, it's, it's my it's my nervous laugh, really, isn't, isn't it? it? Yes, yeah, it's a nervous You'll laugh. You'll be but, fine. Uh, <laughs> I will be fine. <laughs> I'm sure I will be able to cope. Okay. Uh, but anyway, right now, uh, just yeah. before we uh, talk a, a look at the papers, uh, uh, last week uh, I did an interview uh, with the Home Secretary, uh, Theresa May, uh, when she visited Brixton. Uh, she was uh, the guest of Operation Black Vote, and uh, she was launching... Uh, an inquiry into deaths in custody. Uh, this is obviously an ongoing uh, sore uh, within the, uh, the community. There's been a number of high profile cases over many, many years. One of the, the latest is uh, Sean Rigg, uh, who died, uh, I think, in 2009 in Brixton Police Station. Uh, and uh, fairly recently, uh, there was a death up in, uh, up in Edinburgh, uh, which there's uh, a lot of uh, concern about as well. So uh, let's have a look at uh, what went on uh, last week with the Home Secretary. Uh, I'm here now with the, uh, the Home Secretary, uh, Theresa May. Thank you very much uh, for joining uh, Ben Television. Uh, now, uh, death in custody has been a burning issue for, for many, many years. Uh, how much Sound? difference will this inquiry uh, really take? Will it change the culture which uh, allows these incidents to happen in the first place? Well, one of the purposes of the inquiry is to look at what has happened in police custody and to ask the question about how that has happened and what can we learn for the future. Uh, and I certainly hope that what will come out of the inquiry will be recommended recommendations that will mean a change so that we reduce the likelihood of a death in police custody happening again. But I also wanted to look at the experience of families. So those who find themselves suddenly hearing that one of their loved ones has died in police custody, how they are treated by the police and by other authorities. I think that that families lie at the heart of this. We have seen some changes before. We've seen cameras introduced in police cells. We're now seeing pilots where police officers themselves are carrying cameras in the streets. Um, but um, incidents of deaths in custody still are occurring. So uh, what would you like to see happen in practical terms to try and prevent uh, these incidents which haven't happened already? Well, it's difficult for me to say here and now what should happen. The po point of the review is to have a look at the incidents of, of uh, deaths in police custody and to ask that question what more can be done, what needs to be changed in order to ensure that we reduce the possibility of a, a death happening in police custody again. Uh, final question, uh, if it's found that uh, individual police officers have contributed to a secret Facebook group uh, making uh, racist comments, should they be sacked? Well, I think I don't want to see any police officer uh, making racist comments. I don't want to see any member of the public making racist comments. Uh, and uh, I would be concerned if it was the case that police officers had uh, been making racist comments. Should they be disciplined? Uh, disciplining of the police is a matter that there's a proper process that takes place in terms of disciplining of the police. We have complaints authorities and a complaint system within police forces themselves. I don't expect any police officer to make racist comments. Uh, thank you, Home Secretary. We're not going to play Matilda McCatrum. Load. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Welcome back to the Big Ben Show. Uh, of course, uh, the Home Secretary Theresa May being rather non-committal there about the story last week that uh, uh, black police, uh, sorry, that uh, police officers uh, had been found uh, to be exchanging racist comments on a Facebook group. Uh, but also, there had been uh, some general welcoming uh, of uh, the announcement by the Home Secretary uh, that uh, she was announcing a death uh, inquiry into deaths in custody. But uh, there are being questions asked about uh, uh, who's going to be chairing it. Uh, what uh, is it going to be uh, looking at? Is it just going to be looking at uh, police cells and police vans or is there a wider cultural change uh, that needs to happen? We'll be uh, uh, dis discussing that um, and more with a guest later on in the show, Leroy Logan, uh, who's a senior police officer. But uh, first let's have a look at uh, the papers with uh, Paul McFarlane, employment lawyer. Welcome back to the show, Paul. Hello, hello. Um, just before we get to the papers, I just want to have a quick comment on the uh, Theresa May. Just yes. To, just from a legal perspective, why she must have been so non-committal. Um, it's because there is a process and it's quite a strict statutory process in terms of disciplining police officers. And if she were to say anything, your direct question, should they be sacked? If she were to say that, that they should be sacked and they were sacked, that probably would probably undermine the fairness of the dismissal and result in them probably getting compensation. So that's the reason mm. why she is being sacked. But it would increase public confidence in the process, which well, is um, important in itself, isn't yeah, it? But yeah, we, but what we don't want to have is a situation where they're sat, they're rightly sat, and then it's like lately as challenged in, 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 in the courts later on. Yeah, but if they were actually found to be making racist comments, yeah. uh, then uh, yeah, but but surely, you know, we, we elect the government, mm -hmm. you know, we elect the Home Secretary, or at least the government uh, mm -hmm. the Home Secretary is come, coming from. Yeah. Uh, so you know, we as a public are putting our confidence in that government. If that government then can't actually say uh, that um, police officers who uh, right, racist comments should be sacked. Surely they've got the right, you know, as public representatives to be doing that. Not before the case is determined. That's my, well, that's the law and that's my view. Because if you make a situation, situation where a senior official, in this case the Home Secretary, is determined that that's, that should be the sanction and that happens, that will completely undermine the fairness of the process and would result in those people getting away with it ultimately. So. Whilst I understand why you make that point, um, I don't think it's a legitimate point to make. But that's 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 a legal, legal perspective. That's, that's legal perspective. <laughs> yeah. If there's any other lawyers out there, you're welcome to call into the show 0208 808 uh, Or indeed, if you uh, just got a comment on any of the stories, uh, including that one, uh, 0208 808 The number will be on the screens um, shortly. You've been looking at the the papers. I see you've been yes. looking at the story about um, Calais. Calais is the one that is really sort of dominating the news over the last uh, few days. Um, and as you've uh, uh, introduced in your introduction, uh, the, the request by a lot of people, including Nigel Farage, to send the army in, um, that is worrying. Uh, as That's you just inflammatory, isn't I mean, it? I think, I think it's, it's very worrying, um, and it doesn't really get down to the heart of the problem, uh, the heart of the problem being why, why are the immigrants coming over in the first place, and, mm. and why have they been allowed, why, why, why have we got to a situation where they, they feel they need to come to, to Britain or come to, to Europe. Um, and there was, I think this, this was an issue that was highlighted a couple of months ago where Italy was calling out for help in terms of dealing with those migrants who are coming from North Africa over to Europe, ultimately to get here. Mm. And we now get to this situation because that situation's mm. happened. Well, of course, many of those um, migrants uh, or you know, um, refugees mm. that are currently in Calais, mm. some of them will have taken that journey across the Mediterranean. Mm. They will have uh, survived. They would have been lucky yeah. enough to, to cross mm. uh, the Mediterranean and uh, reach the other side alive. Mm. Uh, they've come to Calais, and, and now uh, we're, we're having a situation. We've actually had two uh, refugees die mm. in the last week yeah. trying to get over to yeah. Britain. Yeah, I mean, well, why, why do you think that um, they're trying so hard? Because they've come through uh, mostly Italy and then mm. France. Uh, to try and get into Britain. Now, they've passed through two safe countries. Yeah. I, I think there's a perception, whether rightly or wrongly, that Britain is, one, a place where there is work, um, and two, it's seen as uh, a more accepting country than other parts of Europe. And there may be a language issue. I don't know exactly where they're coming from as well. So there's a combination of factors why Britain is seen as the place to come to, and as a consequence whilst they've been in Europe, that, that the ultimate goal is to get to the UK. Um, but we don't really get to the heart of the problem, to me. The heart of the problem is actually making sure that those people in their countries, their, their economies are 
self-sufficient and so they don't feel the need that they need to uh, migrate away from the problem and, mm. and some are lot, coming from conflict zones so oh yeah exactly um, yeah Eritrea. yeah mm -hmm. um and 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 there's been a lot of i think well again farage is sort of the prime mover in this he was saying during the course of the election that we shouldn't as a country uh, be putting in i think it's two percent of our gdp for um international That's development ways, yeah. um well we don't well, know if you percent. yeah but if we don't put that money in we have these sorts of problems because you've got to try and help mm. those countries to help themselves such that people don't feel they need to migrate uh, so i feel that 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 you know, just being an isolationist and just blaming the French, when actually I think the French did have a system, a place in Calais where they held people before, and Britain said that that should be scrapped. Yeah, just um, looking at the front page of the the Sun here, I'm just going to uh, to hold it up. Uh, if we can uh, get the camera on that, uh, that says uh, uh, "Softy Calais goes ballistic." Uh, Frenchies are atrocious. Uh, this is the Sun's contribution uh, to the debate. Uh, of course, their pun on the uh, uh, supercalifragilistic expialidocious uh, thing. I mean, this this doesn't help, does it, Paul? No, I think I think it's it's highly inflammatory, um, and as I say, it doesn't get to the heart of the problem. Obviously, there there is an immediate problem, um, namely uh, the the chaos and the issues that it's having with the economy um, for us, uh, and and things steps do need to be taken in terms of diplomatic steps to try and resolve that issue but uh, I think there's a more fundamental problem in trying to help those countries help themselves and until we get to that deal with that issue we're not going to get anywhere with this this is going to be a recurring theme I suspect um, there was also uh, someone made a good point I heard I think it was on the radio today um, just a member of the public and they were saying um, <clears throat> it would be perhaps we could be taking more migrants on and we've got lots of because um, people are trying to think of solutions because what it seems is happening is that this problem um, is either just coming more to the public awareness or it's becoming worse. So even with all the migration, anti-immigration anti rhetoric of the UKIP uh, of the past few years and mm. that kind of thing, this problem is actually becoming exacerbated, it's becoming worse, to the point of now we're talking about Nigel Farage saying send, send the army in. And I don't know if he means it in a kind of Olympic civic way where they, they, they'll make a better job of manning the borders or if they mean go mm. there with guns and literally treat people. Well, it's got a bit of an echo of, uh, for example, in, in Italy, uh, the, uh, the far right and Northern League uh, called for uh, boats uh, to, be, to be bombed. To be, mm. to be shot mm. at uh, in the Mediterranean. In Australia, you've had Australian politicians say, uh, shoot down the boats that are coming to Australia. Yeah. And it just seems that there's a bit of a, a parallel here with uh, Nigel Farage now saying, send in the army. Yeah, I mean, there's a crisis, there's a problem, and these people aren't, um, you know, f f they're fleeing, like you said, sometimes war-torn situations, um, oppressive regimes, um, and, you know, f fleeing for their lives in, in a lot of cases. I mean, I don't see too many um, women or children in the pictures that are shown on the press. So what the press often shows is lots of pictures of kind of able-bodied young men. Sometimes they're laughing. Sometimes it looks like they're having a bit of a, of a jolly and like they're trying to get one, one over on on other countries and that's the kind of impression that I mm. think is given but we had Emmanuel um, Akinwaton remember and he was explaining to us about you know the, the complexity of this problem and um, you know the regimes that people are fleeing from and it really does need a cross um, cross country look at um, the, the causes of yeah. the cause of this, and, and, and it needs, it's a yeah, and, and all countries need to play their mm. part in helping people that are fleeing for their lives. Yes, no, absolutely. Okay, uh, we'll just move on to I another believe. story. Uh, one of the a big game hunting is in the news. Yes, um, this is the uh, dentist from the USA who has been found to have killed uh, Cecil the lion. This is Walter James Palmer. Yes, he's now in hiding. Um, and. Uh, I think, again, you alluded to it in your introduction. I, I mean, it's a story. I, I, I accept that. And, it, and, it's, and it's very sad that this lion has been killed and it shouldn't have been killed. But um, you do have to wonder why this is getting so much coverage. <laughs> there's there's uh, a picture uh, on the screen there. Um, of course, uh, I hardly need to point out that uh, Walter James is on the right <laughs> and uh, Cecil the lion is on the left. Yeah. Yeah. And Cecil's not the dentist, right? Um, <laughs> they do look quite similar, actually, yeah, especially when you compare them side by side. 
but you, 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 do, you do have to wonder why this is getting so much coverage and the, and, and the, 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 the numerous deaths in custody or deaths at the hands of uh, police officers in America mm. doesn't attract as much attention. Because we've had uh, uh, recently Sandra Bland, uh, who died in, Amer in custody in America, and we've had um, and hardly Sandra any coverage. And Sandra yes, is a yeah. more recent one. Yes. Since she died, there's yes. been about two other women mm. and one other man. That's Shocking. been just, you know, mm. shot or, or, or killed killed and the, suspe the, the circumstances mm. are suspicious. In case of Sam Dubose, you know, the police officer, the, the, the footage shows the police officer shot him in the head, but that footage came out afterwards, but the police report totally contradicted that. But, mm. you know, so it's... Um, and it's, and it's, it's one after another. Um, and It's traumatic, and and, 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 and the trouble is um, that, you know, America doesn't seem to be willing to do anything about mm. their gun laws. I mean, uh, Obama was on... Uh, he was interviewed by a BBC journalist last week and he said the one thing that has uh, troubled him during the course of his presidency is the fact that America is not willing to change mm. its gun laws, one, and two, uh, there's an issue around police's attitude towards mm. black people and, uh, and you know, uh, being so, so responsible. Tell me, so tell me about um, the Cecil the Lion because it's on uh, two of the front pages today. We've got uh, plenty of inside pages uh, talking about um, Cecil the Lion as well. Uh, as I said in the, uh, uh, earlier in the show, 130,000 people have signed the Justice for Cecil the Lion well, it's not um, only the, petition. Well, it's not only that, Lester. You've got, obviously, you've got the Calais story that's... Um, I don't know, probably, like you said, two people passed away this week, so maybe that's why it's come to the fore. You've got Cecil the Lion, which um, I, I heard about, but um, mm. and like, like you said, it's, it's, it's disgusting. But Well, I stopped having sympathy when, uh, when a name, uh, I heard the name was Cecil, because, of course, Cecil is Cecil Rhodes, right, okay. uh, who, uh, uh, you know, uh, founded... Yeah. Uh, Symbolic. Well, founded Rhodesia. He didn't found, found Rhodesia at all. He, uh, he took over. He happened upon it and um, then happened, decided, happened decided upon, he wanted it. Ha happened upon it. And, of course, uh, this actually happened in Zimbabwe. But, but my point is, you've also got this week going on um, in the Old Bailey you've got the trial with Kenneth Clark and um, a chap called Ben Fellows and this has hardly been covered by the media and I think this is the big story I think this is the story which is being covered by all these other stories because you know whether Ken Clark um, comes out of this having you know whatever the verdict okay. is yeah. it's it's been trying to minimize the, the, the attention around him being in court at the moment being accused of you know a sexual offence and this plays into all the okay, stuff that's yeah. been going on with the government. Uh, I, I, just, I just have to say for, uh, uh, it, for, for, for legal purposes that he's denying the, the, the accusations yeah, at the he's moment. he's denying them. Um, so uh, so we'll, we'll obviously keep, uh, keep, keep track <laughs> of that. But what I'm saying is it's mm. not been in the press. It's yes. not been reported. And, and, and to, to me, you ask, why, is, why are we all talking about Cecil? You know... I, this is what mm. I'm saying. Why are yeah. we not talking about some other stuff? But isn't it all so part? Of the, I mean, Paul. One of the issues is that we're just more attracted sometimes. Not we are here, but uh, sometimes the public is more attracted to animals than it is to humanitarian crisis. I mean, a story came out this week mm. uh, talking about um, legacy donations to charities, mm. and uh, the RSPCA, the Royal Society for the Protection of Animals, gets ten times the amount of donations as Oxfam does. And that's not even when you look at um, taking into account uh, other charities like the Royal Society for the protection of birds, which gets a huge amount of, of income as well. You know, why is it that uh, you know old ladies in in Britain are giving so much money to to um, pets and birds, but not to humanitarian well, issues? I'm obviously not here to answer for old ladies. No, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, well, I have no idea to be honest. I mean, it's, yes. it's, I think uh, I, I think uh, Britain is a nation nation that loves animals yeah. historically. Um, and that's part of it, part of its history, that it is, loves animals. And that probably is a, a large reason why we're in the situation where mm. there are so many contributions being made. Is it about um, white privilege, though, in a sense? Because, uh, uh, bear with me on, on this okay. one. <laughs> because, uh, you know, because, um, you know, uh, white people generally are, although you have a you know, poor white working class, um, Generally speaking, they're doing you know a lot better because of the privilege uh, that um, you know the white community has actually had as a result of some of the things that have happened in the past, like enslavement. Mm. So they're um, automatically less likely to be sort of considering you know the developing world, and more likely to, or they've got more of a luxury of you know giving their attention to. 
to animals. I wondered how you were going to tie that in. I was like, where's he going? <laughs> well, <laughs> why am I going on completely the wrong yeah, track? Can I, give you a theory? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. If, I don't know if the two are interrelated. I wouldn't. I wouldn't like to say that they're necessarily okay. interrelated. Just in my mind. But <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow. Yeah, yeah that, I, mean, that is quite I, I know what you're saying, but I tell you what. I th someone, I think a lady said like they see uh, people. Some people see animals as defenceless, and I think they see human beings as kind of culpable in their own demise, whatever that demise may have been. So um, people see animals as having no defences, you know, and, and human beings. But I think what people have to realise is that often human beings are defenceless, and I think that's mm. what gets missing sometimes. We, we see people in certain circumstances mm. and we choose to say, well, what did they do mm. to end up in that circumstance? Of course, uh, lions themselves are brutal killers, and uh, yeah. in fact, uh, nobody's talking about lion on lion violence. But anyway, we'll just come to uh, the end of this segment. Um, thanks very much, okay. uh, Paul, thanks, for, for Paul. coming. I really appreciate right. that. Uh, we're just going to take a break now, and we'll be coming back uh, talking to uh, Leroy Logan about uh, the London mayoral election campaign. So see you in a couple of minutes. day because of them those who matter most world remit works with you we enable you to instantly send money to africa when they need it worldremit.com download
Welcome back to the Big Ben Show with me, Lester Holloway and Alex Watson. Enough of uh, uh, Cecil the Lion, unless of course you want to speak about it, you can uh, call into the show, the number will be on the screen shortly. But uh, personally, we want to move on to uh, bigger and, uh, and better things. And uh, we want to talk about um, affirmative action. Uh, the, uh, one of the candidates uh, for London Mayor, uh, Sadiq Khan, has been um, arguing uh, that we need to introduce uh, affirmative action in the Metropolitan Police in order to try and make some progress progress in get a, getting better racial diversity uh, in the uh, London uh, police force. Uh, currently the number of uh, uh, black and ethnic minority recruits is uh, just one in six, uh, which is uh, down from one in four uh, the uh, previous year. So uh, what is happening in the Metropolitan Police uh, that uh, uh, black people are not uh, rushing to join uh, the, uh, the police force and uh, is that the answer? Uh, I actually attended um, an, uh, uh, an election hustings uh, last Saturday organised by Operation uh, black vote where Sadiq Khan was uh, alongside the other London uh, mayoral uh, contestants uh, uh, Diane Abbott, uh, Sadiq Khan, Christian Walmart and uh, Tessa Jell and uh, I have to say that uh, we don't have any footage of it but it was a, a very very lively event indeed and uh, uh, joining us now in the studio is uh, Leroy Logan uh, former uh, senior police officer um, mm -hmm. just uh, recently retired and of course uh, two years, two years. Uh, two years mm -hmm. and uh, supporting uh, Sadiq Khan uh, in his bid to be the uh, London uh, Labour candidate for, uh, for Mayor. Welcome to the show, uh, Leroy. Okay, good to be here. Um, uh, first of all, just um, looking at the issue of affirmative action uh, and the police, because uh, uh, the question about uh, how to diversify the police has been around for uh, a very, very long time. Of course, so you were um, uh, formerly uh, a leading light in the uh, Black Police Association, which has been pushing uh, some of still these out, still issues. Out. Uh, still out, okay. Yeah, like uh, so, just because yeah. you retire doesn't mean that you, uh, you get exactly. out of the uh, First uh, the time BPA. Stay on the executives. So. Okay, okay. Well, uh, fantastic. And, uh, you know, we, ha we had, um, uh, you know, we've had a number of uh, BPA representatives. But let's actually get back to, uh, to the issue as well. Mm -hmm. uh, is uh, Sadiq Khan taking uh, the issue further forward than uh, other uh, people have in the past? Well, I mean, I I've known Sadiq Khan uh, since when I was uh, chair of the London uh, Black Police Association. And also uh, I was the first national chair. So I, I know him from the late 90s, early O's. And um, we were making submissions to the Morris Inquiry in 2003 about uh, affirmative action, and, and, and Sadiq took an active role, and that's long before he became an MP in 2005. So I know he's got an understanding of what affirmative action is, and I believe he's got the vision and the drive and determination to make it happen, and holding the commissioner uh, to account to make sure that they have the supervision and leadership mm. to assist people, not only but of course to join, the, but to mm. stay. But in election campaigns, the candidates uh, from all parties typically say, we're going to hold the police to account. Mm. When they actually get into office, they say, we need to listen to what the commissioner has to say. Well, I think, again, because Sadiq was a civil rights lawyer, he knows how to challenge. Uh, he's got the depth of understanding, the knowledge, the experience and expertise to do that. And he's also surrounding himself with the right sort of people like me to do that. Um, and, and I think that's the important thing. And he's, you know, a very forensic lawyer. He, he goes into the detail. He doesn't rely on what he's being told. He makes sure he's got the right sort of questions to ask to ensure that um, people are held to account. And more importantly, to verify it's happening with the right performance indicators, the right sort of review, and hopefully the right outcomes, not just outputs, but mm. outcomes. Nice. So what's your role in, in his campaign? Are you just a supporter? Or I, I, I'm a supporter. Um, um, I spoke at the launch of his campaign uh, a few weeks ago in his um, home patch in Earlsfield in, in South West London. And uh, also I'm, I'm working with a team to do a youth event called Dare to Dream. So hashtag Dare to Dream. Uh, it's on the 4th of August in uh, the South Bank, so if mm. you want to um, have a look at that, you can go on my Twitter account. What's that event about? It's basically giving young people an opportunity to discuss these issues that are impacting on them in London, mm. uh, not just policing, mm. but housing, transport, all these things that people want to know about. And of course, um, Sadiq will attend, but it's, it's mainly for the young people to 
discuss mm. these issues. I know that so Sadiq Khan has been taking selfies with young people and the, the hashtag uh, dare to dream. Mm. Uh, but uh, looking at um, the mayoral contest, uh, you're supporting uh, Sadiq, uh, obviously. Uh, what makes him uh, better uh, than Diane Abbott or uh, David Lammy, for example? I think from, from, from my concern, um, from my perspective even, he, he has shown a good track record as a councillor, he was a councillor for 13 years. Mm, in Wandsworth, yes. Uh, yeah, in Wandsworth. And then, of course, a civil rights lawyer. And he's still... Um, but Diane Abbott has a longer track record, doesn't she? Well, yeah. Because, because I'm, she, I'm, she goes I'm, back uh, centuries. Uh, well, <laughs> I don't know about that. But, but, but also, it's around what are the yeah. um, outcomes since um, Sadiq has been uh, Shadow London um, Minister for the Labour Party and where we saw... Um, a very, very significant labour um, result, positive results in London. And a lot of people say it's because of Sadiq's mobilising and galvanising people. And I've spoken to a couple of MPs who have said if it wasn't for Sadiq, they might have been on the, um, on the list that, uh, or they might not have been selected at all. So, you know, he, he is someone who gets around. Um, I think he's got the dynamic nature. He's a fresh perspective, a new kid on the block, let's say, mm. and uh, I, for me, uh, knowing the man, knowing what he's done, um, he's his own person, he's got a vision, I, in fact, uh, I, I made a submission to the Fabian Society paper on Our London, edited by Sadiq, so that he was, that was like his manifesto, and that was in November um, 2013, so, you know, he has got, for me, a lot of the credentials to say, yep, I want to do this and this is how I want to do it. So does he, does he come to you for advice, obviously, uh, on the police, um, but does he ask you kind of, obviously he's a lawyer, he's detailed merchant, but does he ask you about the kind of anecdotal stuff? That, that yeah, he wants to know what's beyond the culture, what fuels the culture, you yeah. know. Why is that people will want to join, but they don't stay. You're mm. five to six times more likely to leave in the first couple of years if you're black than you're white. Mm. Have you I, got a, uh, sorry to cut you, have you got a, a view on that? Yeah, well, you know, he, he's taken my view. And that, and that is because the supervision and leadership, especially at the lower ranks, is not there um, ec be echoing what's happening at management board. Because all the management board, the commissioner and his team, mm talk the right sort of things, but does it filter down to the, to the supervision at the lower ranks? And to make sure that those offers from minority groups get the same exposure mm. and, 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 and expertise and but opportunities been, to build a portfolio. But he hasn't been talking about that, because when it is, uh, certainly the articles I've read uh, have been talking about uh, you know, increasing diversity in the police force, uh, racial diversity, which we'll all agree with, and talking about recruitment. But actually, when we're talking about retention and keeping them in and changing the culture, um, I haven't read anything about that. Or you know, is that, are those policies being developed at the moment? They're being developed. Yeah, yeah, so, what would it include? I mean, what sort of things are needed in order to bring about that cultural change? So, well, the black officers don't around, leave. It's around yes. spotting the talent. Yes. It's around managing the talent to make sure you can give them the confidence to put themselves forward. Because that's the other thing. You know, there's a lot of corridor conversations. Oh, I don't think you're ready for the next. Um, Promotion. Oh, why is that? Oh, you know, you need a bit more depth and breadth of experience. I had that as chief inspector, mm -hmm. going into superintendent, was chair of the Black Police Association, and I had to tell that senior cop, to be quite honest, just this conversation, I could take you to employment tribunal. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people don't have that um, confidence to do that. And more importantly, um, it might knock them back. Fortunately, I went for superintendent and the rest is history. So that's the, those sort of nuances of the culture really need to be addressed to ensure that if a supervisor stops someone from um, putting themselves forward, they'll be held to a task, you know, held to account. So you have to do a proper health check of all the, the boroughs and all the units to ensure that black um, personnel are going through the ranks and not being held back. What do you think um, would be um, an ideal future state? Because obviously there is a need for a black police association. You know, you're still part of that organisational body. So as a, a police officer that served for 30 years and rose up high, very high in the ranks, um, do you feel now that you've left, a, I always do these two prone questions, do you, did you feel by the time you left, this is going to sound like a stupid question, but more of a police officer or when you're in that situation, do you feel like more of a police officer or like more of a black man? And, and, and that's I think it's a very really good question because I had to make sure, yeah. even before I joined, I said I'm a black man who happens to be a cop. Right. Because here I am at the other end of the 30 years, I'm still a black man. Mm. So that puts it clearly in your mind, what do you stand for? Mm. Uh, you know, I, I'll work with a team, I'll do my best, 
um, to ensure that we do the best for, the, for Londoners. Mm -hmm. But I'll make sure, I'm not falling into misplaced loyalties, I'm not going to conform to the norms and values of the organisation if it means that I lose my principles and I, form, I start to assimilate. I'm going to make sure that I bring my expertise and experience to enrich the culture. And that's mm. what the culture should do. It doesn't celebrate diversity, and unfortunately, it doesn't allow people to have, feel confident to express themselves mm. from their c cultural perspective. Absolutely. Uh, well, we'll definitely be keeping a close eye on the London campaign. Unfortunately, we've uh, spent far too long reviewing the papers <laughs> <laughs> before, you, uh, okay. before you arrived and getting into uh, Calais and, uh, and Cecil the Lion. So, uh, so we have to, uh, to say goodbye to you. Well, I don't mind being a victim of Cecil the Lion. I'm going to get you back on my new show, which is going to be all about the police. I'm absolutely. Yeah, we'll be talking about um, uh, yeah. Alex's new show uh, just uh, just before we, uh, we we sign off as well. So we're going to take a, a short break, and we'll be back uh, talking uh, uh, with the uh, historian uh, Martin Hoyles about um, some historical black historical characters in Britain that you may not have necessarily heard about. So uh, stay tuned, and uh, we'll be back uh, right after uh, these messages. Matter most. World Remit works with you. We enable you to instantly send money to Africa when they need it. WorldRemit.com. Download. Television Sky 182. Every Friday, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., we give you all the information relating to entertainment and up to date news from the Caribbean. Presented by Pam Joseph. Ben Television Bridging the Gap. Of the confusion that we have in Lagos is also the political situation and on politics with KO what we try and do is to go beyond the confusion and get something really meaningful. Welcome back to the Big Ben Show with me, Lester Holloway and um, Alex Watson. And uh, thanks very much to uh, uh, Leroy Logan, senior policeman and uh, spokesman, it seems, for uh, Sadiq Khan uh, for coming uh, into the show. Uh, now, um, I asked just before the, uh, uh, the break, uh, who is uh, Otaba uh, Kuguano? Uh, who is uh, William uh, Cafe? Uh, you may not know unless you're uh, definitely a student of uh, black British uh, history, but uh, someone who uh, is here to tell us is uh, someone who's uh, written uh, books uh, about 
about uh, those uh, two characters and, uh, uh, and much more besides. Uh, Martin Hoyles, uh, welcome to the show, Martin. Mm -hmm. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, <laughs> now is it uh, your mission to uh, dig out the black historical characters that are not so much talked about? Because, you know, we know or, you know, we've got, got growing awareness in Black History Month and schools about, you know, the likes of, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 you know uh, Equiano and so on. But um, we don't hear much about the characters that you, you write books about. Well, there are certain characters that are still are not very well known, that's why. I mean, if you take Kagono, uh, I don't think anybody's heard of him, really. Well, just reference who that is, that's, um, can you, sh it's, um, K can you explain to us who Kago, there's the book, Kaguano. Yeah. Kaguano, yes, Yeah. was one of the uh, campaigners against the slave trade in the 18th century, and he was a uh, originally a slave himself. He was kidnapped from Africa uh, in present-day Ghana. Take, uh, as he was old, uh, only 13 years old then, and taken to the West Indies and was a slave there for several years before he was brought to England. And uh, here he somehow became free and became a servant to a couple of artists. And that's when he got involved in the campaign against the slave trade. Mm. And he eventually wrote a book which uh, argued against it. But what was interesting about him, unlike uh, Equiano, he was against slavery itself as well, not just the slave trade. And mm. so he was ahead of his time there, you know, ahead of even people like Wilberforce. Wilberforce is the only person people know really about uh, the campaign against the slave trade. But he wasn't against slavery. He thought it was okay for the time being because they weren't civilized enough to be free. Mm. So it's, it's partly in the book I'm trying to debunk Wilberforce yeah. as well as put forward other people who are more important. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Before we talk about, uh, you know, uh, William Cofe, uh, what's really sparked your, um, your interest? I mean, have you always, you know, been interested in, uh, in, in uh, Black British history or the, uh, the slave trade? I think the first time I got interested was reading Peter Fryer's book, Staying Power, The History of Black People in Britain. Mm. And that opened my eyes to all the people that hadn't been heard of before. Mm. How, certainly how not old were you then, roughly? Uh, I should think in my 20s. Okay, yes. Yeah, so it was some time ago. And then since I got married uh, to my wife, Asha, I got even more interested in black history. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started off doing a book called Remember Me, which was achievements of mixed race people, past and present. And we wrote that for our daughter, Rosa, in particular. But that revealed a whole he a heap of people that had not been uh, talked about before, going right back to Robert Wedderburn. 200 yeah. years ago, mm -hmm. and so that was the, the way we got into it, and since then we've done quite a lot of research on um, black history with my wife, particularly to do with dyslexia and uh, performance poetry, and uh, it's gone on from there really, can't stop. <laughs> so how did you come across the character Coguano, um, and how did you go about researching and um, pu pulling the book together, because like you said, um, one of the things that you mentioned early on in the book is that we do know about William Wilberforce and he's kind of um, attributed with as the kind of person that ended the slave trade and we don't often hear much about other characters or about the um, abolitionist movement or the uprisings that continually happened during slavery that contributed to the end of the actual practice. Um, but where did you go about finding the, the information? Um, well, I, I go to the British Library regularly and do a lot of research there. Yeah. And what was interesting was that the campaign against the slave trade was a massive campaign in this country. Hundreds of thousands of people were involved in it. And all we hear about is Wilberforce, mm. which is nonsense. I mean, women were involved. They had a sugar boycott to try and stop people, you know, okay. drinking tea with sugar from the West Indies in it. And Wilberforce actually opposed that. He said women aren't, to, aren't meant to be involved in politics. Mm -hmm. So it's a question of redressing the balance of history, really. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, famously, uh, William Wilberforce wouldn't let black people into his house as well. Exactly. That, that's, that's certainly what, uh, you know, what I've heard and read anyway. Um, no, I've got the evidence the in the you, book. You have evidence in the yes, book? Okay, yes, cool, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll give the book a little bit of a plug um, yeah. uh, shortly. Mm. Uh, of course, so we've got um, uh, a march against uh, or in favour of reparations, which is happening uh, this Saturday. It's, uh, it's happening at 11am uh, at uh, Windrush Square in Brixton, and they're marching to Parliament. Of course, last year there were around 7,000 people that took place uh, in the march. Uh, that was uh, the organisers' estimates. I think the police said about three or 4,000, but uh, there's always a difference <laughs> between police, police estimates figures, and uh, yeah. the actual Different. number of uh, feet on, on the streets, uh, so to speak. But, uh, uh, you know, looking at 
that's uh, the, the issue of, of enslavement uh, br brings um, us al almost inexorably to, to the issue of uh, what uh, happens as a result of it. Uh, of course, we had the uh, documentary, uh, just a two-part documentary by uh, David mm -hmm. Saga, yeah. which we've been discussing extensively uh, on this uh, show. Uh, but uh, you know, do you think that uh, knowing more about uh, you know, the, the likes of Otaba uh, Koguano will actually um, uh, sort of, you know, feed into... Um, you know, as a sort of logical conclusion, talking about um, not just uh, enslavement, but reparations as well? Yes, I, I do think so. And I think definitely it should be on the agenda. I was asked this recently at uh, another talk I gave, and somebody wanted to look into their own ancestry and see who was involved in it and so on. And in the programme you mentioned, there's a lot of evidence of who received the money, the £20 million that was paid out in 1834, was it, mm. for 1835, mm. went to all the slave owners. And they were all around this country, all over the place. Widows, churches, ministers, everybody. And people in the Caribbean as well got, um, um, you know, compensated. <clears throat> but that, that's not here on the, on the table today, but another one that I read that you wrote was about um, somebody called Ira Aldridge, who was an actor. Um, kind of Shakespearean actor, and a kind of all-round actor. And from the book, I really got the impression that he was kind of, you know, Samuel L. Jackson, Denzel, like, <coughs> like a, a brilliant... All rolled into one. Yeah, I got the impression that he was... He was the most celebrated actor in the whole of Europe in the 19th century, Ira Aldridge. Mm. And so many people still haven't heard of him. I mean, he came from New York when he was age 17 and got a part playing Othello almost straight away in an East London theatre. And he, he toured the whole of Europe. He went to Russia, mm -hmm. to Germany, Poland and so on. In fact, he was buried in the end in Poland where he died on tour. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that I read in that book was that after a lot of his performances, he often would kind of give a speech, an anti-slavery yeah. speech. So he was a very strong activist and advocate and he was well respected and well renowned for it. Exactly, and he sent money back to the States as well to help yeah, slaves. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And of course, uh, another book as well, which I'll just uh, hold up here, giving a big a book <laughs> plug, if we can get the Thank camera on it. Um, no, we haven't got the camera on it. Um, is, uh, is William uh, Cuffe, who's a Chartist uh, leader. Uh, now, uh, there we go, if we get that. Um, now, um, the Chartists, of course, w um, w were contributed to the, the Magna Carta, I, b I believe. And uh, maybe I've got this wrong. So I'm sure yes, you're, you're correct me as a celebrating the 800th anniversary of, uh, of, of the Magna Carta. Mm. I'm sure you'll correct me on that point. But uh, William <laughs> yeah. Cuffe was a, a very prominent um, Chartist. So tell, tell us a little bit about, uh, about him. The Chartist movement, again, is neglected. Mm. I mean, of course, it's a working-class movement yeah. that was the biggest political movement ever seen in this country and was campaigning for rights to vote, basically, and for uh, MPs to be paid so they didn't have to be rich people. All those kind of things were going on in the 19th century. There was a lot of trade, un trade unionism, activism as well, wasn't there? Yes, to, yeah, to yeah, trade well, unions. Better before conditions. The trade unions were, were formed, surely? No, no, they were formed. I mean, Cuffe was a member of the Tailors' Union, and they, he was on strike in 1834, a strike which failed, and after that he couldn't get any work because of that, and that's when he joined the Chartists, campaigning for more civil rights. Okay. But what's interesting about him is uh, his grandfather was an enslaved African, his father was a slave in St. Kitts, and uh, mm -hmm. he eventually got freed and came and settled in Chatham, okay. where William Cuffey was born. Definitely. Uh, time is uh, unfortunately uh, against <laughs> us. Uh, it is. It's uh, flown by oh uh, like, uh, uh, like nobody's business. Uh, it's like an arrow, literally, time has flown by. Uh, just a quick plug, um, Martin Hoyles. You can find uh, all your books in, on Hansib, published by Hansib. So uh, just uh, uh, go and look that up. And uh, definitely... Uh, worth the read. Um, now, um, Alex, uh, this is your last show. You're uh, about oh, to uh, yeah. uh, leave me and uh, form your, your own uh, show, which is um, broadcasting tomorrow. So yes. uh, just uh, uh, one more, just very briefly, uh, to tell us about it. Yeah. Um, it's a show, I, I don't... I don't think I want to reveal the name of the show just quite yet. I'm okay. kind of doing it a bit under the radar. It's a secret at the moment. <laughs> it's a secret. Yeah, but it is about um, law enforcement, about the police, about um, community relations. And we will be having guests on and, you know, um, probably developing and evolving the format um, um, 
as we see how it goes, but we're, there's going to be definitely a, a large element of having the police in to talk to us, to talk to us all, and hopefully this will um, engender some some positive dialogue, but also get under the skin of some of the issues that have um, that okay. that are there. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's been, been an absolute pleasure. It's been a great working you, with you uh, as well on, on the show. Uh, I will be back. Uh, <laughs> Uh, as always, uh, next Thursday at uh, 1 o'clock, so uh, tune in then for, for much more uh, discussion, uh, guests and much, much more. So uh, have a fantastic day and I will see you next week.